It is turn 44, I think. I'm still feeling very unwell, however, I am dosed to the eyeballs on legal over-the-counter medications, and it is time for my turn today. This is one of those slightly empty turns where there's very little for me to say and do. There's not much good news here, except for the fact that we got decent blood slave income this turn. And one of our scouts very far away has died. I kind of forgot that I had scouts far away. If I had my if I had my wherewithal, I would have uh, sent a bunch more scouts out fairly soon, especially into Pangaea territory, which we do still have a couple floating around in there. But that's kind of kind of on the back burner. I need everything I have right now. This is going to be a very very quick one. There's nothing new to say. It's one of these awkward logistical turns where there's nothing to do but shuffle a bunch of people around. As you can see, he did retreat back to this castle. That's understandable since he does not want to lose his throne, which means that we have to chase after him. So the main army is going to go chase after him and kill that. The The former main army, the secondary army, is now going to head home and uh, refresh, pick up, and then form a, basically form a, a stack as deadly as this one. We're having our these guys go here, which is a slightly inefficient use of their time, but um, it'll still come in handy. We can seize two provinces instead of one because they are equipped to be heavy thugs and can basically take a province by themselves. I've also got people bringing those blood slaves in and different blood slave people heading out. I'm also making a few more blood dowsing rods so that I can boost so that I can boost blood slave production even further and other terrible things that capitalists say. Apart from that, we're recruiting wolves in a few different places, both wolf commanders and act just wolf riders and we're summoning more wolves. I would like to get a couple of wolf riders with a team of wolves moving around to clear up the unrest being caused by the blood hunting, because honestly, these peasants are so unreasonable. It's frankly absurd that they won't just let me march into their homes and abduct their children to, to put them in the big blood extraction machine we have set up in the capital. Also, there's a story event going on here, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so frankly, I'll deal with it later. But this might be our first story event in this campaign, so I'll just go over what they are right now, which is interconnected chains of events that, unlike the ordinary event chains, require you to do something to make them progress to the next step, and if you don't do something, they might progress to a worse path. Generally speaking, all that's required is that you have the right kind of unit in the province, and then you make it do the right kind of command while it's there. So, for example, a priest preaching, a group of soldiers searching, that kind of thing. But I think some have unique commands only available in the affected province. They can have really good beneficial effects, but they're also kind of buggy and weird. So that's kind of all I have to say today. I'm recruiting, I'm summoning, I'm being very, very careful about this, especially since we've now lost this capital, which is like going to turn our money production down by like three, four hundred to turn. So main goal is going to be pushing back into his territory and making sure that I have a couple of big stacks that can fight this one, which should be interesting to see happen. And that really is it for this turn. Another relatively light turn here today. We've got a few things we need to check out on here. There's been a few battles that aren't especially relevant. This is just us taking provinces that we that can then uh, do other stuff in. Got a few blood slaves, got a couple deaths. Interestingly, the fortification in Urfel has been breached. I don't remember where Urfel is. <laughs> so let's go take a look at that. Ah, over here. Okay, that's fine. We knew we were losing that. That was part of the treaty that I made with... Pangaea. So we've got another spiderwebby turn. I'm not going to bore you with the details of my logistical stuff elsewhere. The important thing, and the only real thing that's happening this turn, is that there's probably going to be a huge battle in this province next turn. So this army's breached this fortress, but it's pretty heavily wounded. It looks like a big army because it's got most of my remaining giants, but the actual firepower, the wizards, are heavily depleted. I'm, they're out of blood slaves. There's only one blood slave left between all of them, including on our port portable gem dispenser guy, so they can't really take a fight. I don't know if man has been doing enough scouting to have seen me win fights, because lord knows I haven't won very many, so I don't know if he knows how, how tough this could be for him. Also, it looks like his army is about half the size it was listed as previously. That probably means that it's about 300, 350, because scout reports are, as always, inaccurate. So I think he thinks I'm going to take this castle, so he's going to step here this turn to retake it, expecting either me to abandon this province or to just fight this army. But what I'm actually doing is moving this army into position. This is an army I've constructed specifically to try and kill this stack. I think he thinks this army is going to head on to here, and that this army is either going to abandon or take this fortress. But no, I'm going to alter the course. I'm going to have this army step to here. 
And instead of removing all of these forces, one, two, three, four, and five of these guys are going to remain behind. This will leave all of my giants in the province, which will solve the problem of this army not having enough chaff in front to block the charge before the big battlefield spells can get cast and start causing serious problems. And we'll provide a few more casters. Remember, my astral casters can join communions without you needing to use blood slaves to spam skeletons during the battle. And most importantly, this guy being here means that I will be able to cast Grip of Winter and win the battle that much faster. So I'm confident that with the dregs of this force and these guys, this should be an easy win. However, it should also be a big, serious battle. So I'm looking forward to seeing that next turn, unless he does something else, something unexpected, like going, for example, to here or to here, which will be slightly irritating for me, but not the end of the world. As an aside, my thugs are going to sneak into here, which actually means they're going one, two, three, four, five, which I didn't know they could move that far, but they do have boots that in are increasing their map movement by a fairly high margin. So they should be able to just zoop straight, but straight into his back line and then start taking a bunch of lightly defended provinces. I forgot to set this guy to attack. He was set to retreat. So he ran into this province and then immediately retreated back into here, which is unfortunate, but also hilarious. So he's going to try to take this province next turn and he'll probably fail, but who cares? And that really should be everything that we need to talk about this turn. There's nothing else going on that I haven't talked about previously. The same kind of recruitment and stuff is going on in the background. Really, we are just waiting to see what happens in this province next turn. So that's going to be all from me. Hello, friends. It is turn 46 and things are getting interesting. I do actually have some stuff to talk about this turn. Although, as you can hear, my voice is still a little bit broken from not being well. There's only one announcement I want to... Well, actually, no... Hildegun captured 13 blood slaves, which is amazing. So, huge props to Hildegun. Although we're going to have to get some patrollers in there to calm everybody down pretty soon. Which, considering that my patrollers will consist of a goblin riding a wolf leading 40 other wolves with no riders, I'm sure that will calm everybody down just fine. There's one battle I want to show you, which is this one. So, this is the fortress that Pangaea has been slowly eroding away over the last four turns, ever since we made our peace agreement, which... I didn't realise would cede that particular province back to him, but obviously it would. That was just a, an oversight on my part, but this is fucking hilarious. So you always get a little bit of province defence in your castle, even once your province has been taken. So even though your province is listed as zero province defence, there's always a handful of last ditch defenders in the castle. This <laughs> this dipshit, this, um, this idiot, he lost one of his difficult high level casters, his important guys. This is like me losing a Scrati to getting hit in the head with a rock, which is just fucking funny, frankly. So I'm going to speed this up because we don't need to watch all of it. This should be an easy win, right? This should be absolute destruction. However, his scripting means that all of these guys have marched over here to fight this group, which means this, this team of hurlers here is just fine. And everybody forgets how much damage these do. They have a ranged attack that does 36 damage. An arrow does like 10. Most creatures don't have 36 hit points. Most giants don't have 36 hit points. You get hit by a boulder, you'll probably die. So all of these guys are just chilling at the back, throwing arrows, fair enough. His pan, for some reason, marches forwards into the range of my hurlers, which we will see happen in just a second. At which point... Um, they throw a rock at his head, which kills him. Come on, lads, you can do it. There it is! Fantastic work, everyone. Nice job, gentlemen. You have successfully defended a fortress, despite the fact there's only six of you and you were facing an enormous army and a powerful wizard. Wonderful job. Mead all around. Absolutely fantastic, you funky little giants. He had more than enough troops just to take that easily. He should have had his pan at the back, buff them a couple times, then just chill. He also should have... <laughs> he should have had a backup commander, at least one, to prevent against the problem of having your leaders get sniped, which is a problem I've talked about in the past and that I've always tried to, tried to avoid by having one or two backup commanders in a, a combat group. <laughs> and now you know why that's important. So, uh, yeah, it looks like this fortress is going to be mine for one more turn, although he can, of course, storm it again next turn. But... It's just hilarious. It's really fucking funny. Anyway, so the main thing I need to talk about this turn is why a big battle didn't happen here. And the short answer is, I've done so much goddamn diplomacy. 
So I woke up this morning to see that Marion has me- had messaged me saying, hey, um, Pangea is kind of just killing the shit out of me. If, uh, if, if everybody else doesn't join in to stop him, we'll, we'll all go down. Uh, he, he's got a triple god. He's in a position to the throne rush if he takes my two thrones. Throne rushing being when you just make a beeline for the remaining thrones and grab them and win before anyone can stop you. And I was like, shit, yeah, that's a good point. So I've gone around and messaged all of the other remaining players in the game, except Pangaea, obviously, and said, hey, have you noticed Pangaea, if he continues to eat Marion, will be in a position to throne rush and win very soon, so everybody needs to put aside their differences? Katis was like, extremely good point. Uh, I'll end my NAP this turn. Nabar has not responded to me. Don't know what's up with that. He's probably just busy. Since, due to brain problems, I tend to do my turns at the last minute. Pelagia said, yep, it's definitely a problem. I'm going to see what I can do about it. And man, man responded to me instantaneously. This motherfucker. I have an irrational dislike of this guy. Because in our very first interaction, he messaged me while I was asleep and said, hey, would you like an NAP? And then six hours later, or maybe a bit longer, but the point is I was still asleep, sent another message saying, well, I guess you don't want an NAP. By the way, I'm taking two of these important territories that you've been wanting to, that you've been fighting for tooth and nail to take from Aruk. I'm sure you're fine with that. And then I wake up in the morning and see that he's taken those two territories out from under my nose, literally as I was about to take them with my own forces, meaning I had to redirect those stupid forces elsewhere. And then he refused to sign an NAP. So... He maintains that he's been nothing but um, polite and reasonable the entire time. I think that he's been kind of a dick. But then maybe I'm unreasonable. Anyway, the point is, we had a long and brutal negotiating session where he got pretty much everything he wanted. I agreed to uh, let him have all of this. So he gets to keep Uruk, he gets to keep these provinces, he gets to keep this province... He's going to give me back this province and this province. Maybe he'll leave this one. I'm actually not sure. We should prob- I should probably double check that with him. And in exchange, he will sign an NAP3 with me and he will uh, end his his NAP with, uh, with Pan this turn so that we can start pushing into him from multiple directions. So Pan is going to turn around tomorrow, I guess, or whenever, how, whenever the timing works out for him, he's going he's gonna to show up and be like, oh shit, okay, three new players are entering the war with me and two of them are going to start hitting me in three turns. So I got to prepare against that. I mean, he might be, he might be huge, but I don't think he's good enough to defend against that. And also the fact that so many of us are going to war with him is innate defense against his elfing capabilities. Elfing being when you sneak troops into people's provinces and, and then flip them, flip several provinces in one turn unexpectedly using stealth troops, which is what he did to me. Honestly, he overcommitted. Um, he thought he could t- beat me all in one turn, I think. And then when my fortresses survived and my stacks were good enough to kill his, his, scattered bands of uh of horsemen that's when he offered me the the offer that he did the six turn nap and that he would give me back all of my territory so his ability to to do that against any of us should be limited because the problem when you have a war on five fronts is that um any attention you pay to any particular one means that the others will just surge in so this is going to be a land grab i suspect if we all if we all hit in at the same time it's going to be absolutely everybody's scrabbling to take as much territory from Pangaea as possible. So what I should probably do, and what I want to do, is get my main stacks over here in position ready to push down this way. I reckon my big communion stacks are not unbeatable, but very hard to beat at this stage of the game. So I'm confident I could just slam straight down to his capital and take it in a few turns. I also want to definitely take this, since every throne we take away pushes him one step further away from winning the game. I should probably have this guy scout out a bit further as well, actually. Also, he thinks he's safe from me specifically because of that six turn NAP, which means he's not going to bother putting much defenses in this province, probably, although he might have someone building a castle there as we speak. And frankly, I am willing to to breach the terms of my NAP. I've announced the end of it to him this turn, so technically it'll be six turns until I can legally attack him, but I'm going to attack him on turn three, uh, all being well. We'll see how the next few turns shake out. Uh, along the side, everybody else, as we all attack him on the same turn, and if he denounces me in public, all I have to say is, well, the general understanding of an NAP is that it's completely fine to break an NAP. If not breaking it results in you losing the game, which I will if we don't all attack him and beat him because he's by far in the strongest position in the game which I think the other players will uh, accept as reasonable. And <laughs> if I do ever play this game again, which I probably won't, because while I think it's a really interesting game and I love the mechanics and the politicking is fascinating as well, 
I just find it so stressful to have to log in and do this every day. Person with brain problems struggles with daily responsibilities. Who knew? What a fascinating, uh, what a fascinating discovery I've made. Anyway, <laughs> that's um, pretty much the important stuff that I needed to talk about this turn. My my patrolling uh, summoning is ongoing. I'm continuing to rebuild my my wizard stock. I'm mostly recruiting Veti instead of uh, any other troops, some wolf riders and mostly just Veti spearmen on the grounds that if I can build those uh, point buff stacks, they'll be very good defense for my for my casters and the casters are the important thing. I'm also prepping to do some offensive casting of foul vapors. My goal is to have two army stacks, two thugs, and maybe a foul vapors stack marching marching through Pan's territory, taking as much of it as I can. I might be, if all goes well, I can seize a lot of territory, but the territory I seize will leave me this weird, awkward, stretched out shape where I have a lot of potential fronts against other players, which is not ideal, but it's also a problem that everyone has late game. One other thing I want to mention is that we're finally, finally putting the effort in to get our alteration going a bit further so that we can get to alteration six, which will give us darkness, which I've explained, God, like 20 turns ago, but it'll, be, it'll factor very, very well into our skeleton spamming. It will also be useful if we can eventually get enough blood mages that we can start summoning fiends, which are quite powerful. They're not so powerful that they're worth using in absence of anything else, but fiends of darkness have, can see perfectly in the dark and can fly, which makes them very effective to use on the same battlefield as someone casting darkness, which means that I can potentially have a, a tidal wave of skeletons marching from my back line to their front line under darkness which is very good for me and very bad for them, while at the same time, a huge swarm of shadow demons leaps onto their back line. I believe they have dark power in addition to being able to see in the dark, which means they're just flat out more powerful. I might put some research into blood magic soon as well, because if I can get to further down the blood magic tree, I can summon larger groups of demons much more efficiently. Something else I want to summon soon is a troll king, which is a very good earth spellcaster, which will be very useful to me for multiple reasons, but I, I need a lot more earth gems. I need 50 to summon him. So I will need several more earth gems and I'll probably have to transmute some stuff from astral. I've got a lot of water gems I'm not using as well. I might spend some of those on a, on a sea king actually, which is not a Pokemon, but <laughs> well, I mean, it is a Pokemon, but it's also a guy. It's a guy. Uh, it's a troll from underwater, I think. So if I look on here, do I even have that spell? I can contact sea trolls. I don't think I can summon the sea king's court yet, but that is something worth doing later on, potentially, especially if it lets me take the fight underwater, which I will need to do eventually if I'm going to win this game. Maybe. It's possible I can win this game without ever going to war with Pelagia because, you know, this, you know, the three or four players left in the game at the end of a game, usually. I could simply ignore the fishmen and seize land thrones. Anyway, that's Everything I need to talk about this turn, I think. Oh, also, these guys are zooming back home, and these guys are stealthed anyway, so it'll be fine. So they'll just pick up some troops and head back, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to have some groups of wolf riders take some of these provinces, hopefully, depending on how it works out. Anyway, that's going to be all from me this turn. Wow, did I never put PD in here? <laughs> Oopsie whoopsie. I should probably do that. Here we go, nice and snug under enough to make sure a scout doesn't take you. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.